The next problem we will take on is the one uh, depicted in this sketch. We have a circular hoop with radius capital R that is rotating around the z-axis, which goes through the center of the hoop uh, as indicated here. So the hoop is uh, oriented in the vertical direction and rotating around the z-axis. Then we have a bead which can slide freely without friction around the hoop. And we want to find the equation of motions for this bead and also find and characterize all the equilibrium points it might have. So as usual, the first step is to ensure that the non-constrained forces have a potential associated with them. Uh, well, that's not too hard. The potential here is just mgz. Uh, second, and there's no other potential since there's no friction. Uh, then we should choose the generalized coordinates since this hoop, when it rot rotates, traces out a sphere. Uh, it's probably a good idea to choose spherical coordinates. R, theta, and phi. Uh, with the difference here that I've chosen theta to be measured from the negative z-axis. So that makes it a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to try to write down the kinetic energy and the potential energy with the constraints already applied because we have a forced constraint here. Because we have a rotation. Constraints depends on time. As we'll see in a minute. Uh, so when I write down the kinetic energy, all I'm going to do is do it in um, spherical coordinates without trying to impose any constraints. That's the velocity in the theta direction, rotating like this. Uh, and then I'm also going to uh, call distance there, this distance there, rho, right? That's the uh, what we normally have called it. Called it. Although, just to maintain perspective, it really should be more like that. So that means now that in order to get the kinetic energy associated with phi, uh, that's really going to be rho phi dot squared, right? Now rho is going to be r times sine of theta. So what we get here then is that the kinetic energy is one half m r dot squared plus the square of r theta dot plus the square of r sine theta phi dot. Okay. Um, the potential energy, we already started writing it here. Now we're not going to use a z since that's not a spherical coordinate. Instead what we're going to get here is m g r cosine theta. And the negative sign here comes from the fact that we are measuring theta from the minus z-axis. <coughs> so that when uh, cosine, uh, when the theta is zero degrees, then we get minus mgr. When it is 90 degrees, we get zero for the potential energy. And that's uh, as it should be. Okay. So that was step three. Now we need to write down the constraints. So there are two constraints. Um, this bead can only move in uh, one direction. Right? It can move back and forth along the hoop. But we have three spherical coordinates. So if you want to reduce the number of coordinates to one, then we need two constraints. Right? So the first constraint is just going to be that R is a constant equal to capital R which means that r dot is zero. And the second constraint, well, that can have to do with the rotation here. Phi is capital omega times t. That ensures a constant uh, angular rotation around the z-axis. So that means that phi dot uh, 
equals omega. And then we can uh, substitute all those things into the kinetic energy and the potential energy. First term be here becomes zero, because r dot is zero, and these r's becomes capital R, and phi dot becomes omega. So this is now So this is the kinetic energy that's associated with motion in the theta direction around the hoop. And this is kinetic energy that's also associated with the rotation of the hoop. So um, in some sense we can call this term here T theta and this term here is T phi. Potential energy uh, doesn't change much. The only thing that happens is that the little r becomes a capital R because it's constant. So this gives us then the expression for the Lagrangian. And from the Lagrangian, we can then calculate a generalized force. And I'm going to for once actually give that a name because we're going to use it later. So Q theta, that's a generalized force associated with the uh, theta direction because there's on, that's the only variable that survives after we've applied the constraints here, right? Then we have general momentum. And then we apply this to the Lagrange equation. So that's the equation of motion. Now this can't be solved analytically, uh, so we'll have to do some approximations if you want to try to uh, get some mathematical truth out of this. But we can see a few things. First of all, it has the right unit. This is unit of per second squared. This is an acceleration divided by a distance, so that's per second squared. The other thing that we can see is that if we take omega equals to zero, that gives us theta double dot equals minus g over r sine theta. That's actually the pendulum equation. And why isn't so hard to see if we look at the picture again? If omega is zero, and this bead is moving along a circular path like this, just like it would if it were attached to um, a beam that was attached here at the middle of the, uh, uh, of the hoop. So it's normal, it should behave like a pendulum if omega is zero. So, so that, looks, that part looks good. The second part of the problem uh, was to find all the equilibria in the equation of motion. So when we find the equilibria, let's move this out to the top here. So we're going to find 
So to do that, um, we normally set the forces to zero, right? Forces are zero at an equilibrium. Now we don't have a force to work with. Uh, we have a generalized force, however, and it acts exactly the same way. When this is zero, then we're at an equilibrium. So this corresponds to setting the generalized force Q of theta equal to zero. Or for that matter, from setting the acceleration here to zero, that's the same thing, right? If the acceleration is zero, then the force is zero, and then we would really get rid of these um, M r squared term here in the beginning, or M r squared factor in the beginning, uh, it will give us the same things. Okay, so this now corresponds with two factors. Uh, we have the sine theta factor here, and then we have the factor within parentheses. So if we look at the sine theta uh, factor first, if it is equal to zero, that corresponds to either theta being uh, zero or it's being pi it's a little bit out of the way here okay so that's those are two possible solutions then the other thing we had was to say that omega squared cosine theta minus g over r equals zero that means that cosine of theta equals g over r omega squared. Now that's only possible if this term here is less than or equal to 1. Right? The cosine of a function, the cosine of a variable can never be bigger than 1. So uh, this exists only if g r omega squared is greater than or equal to 1, or if you will, if omega is less than or equal to the square root of g over r. And the square root of g over r, by the way, is the, uh, um, the oscillation frequency of the pendulum that this would make if capital omega is 0. And that's actually no accident at all. Okay, so it exists only under those circumstances, and under those circumstances, we get two solutions, theta 3, 4, which is equal to plus minus r cosine of g over r omega squared, and the plus minus comes from the fact that cosine of theta is an even function, so um, we could do this and it wouldn't change anything. So, plus minus r cosine of g over r omega squared. Okay, so these are the four solutions that we have. Next, we need to figure out uh, what their character is. Are they stable or unstable equilibria? Now, uh, when, normally when we work with uh, stable or unstable equilibria, what we have done is we have said that, well, the potential, we look at its second uh, derivative. And if the second derivative is positive, then, um, then the equilibrium is stable. Now, in this case, we don't actually have uh, a potential, so we're going to have to make do with our generalized force. But that's really not too different. So let me just do a little bit of a box here. I'm going to talk about some of these things. Right? If we want a stable equilibrium, well, normally that corresponds to having a force, which is, you know, the form of minus k times times x. Okay. Um, another way of saying that then is that we take the first derivative of uh, f of x, that's going to be minus k, <clears throat> and that's less than zero. That's equivalent to setting the second derivative of x 
greater than zero because of course um, f equals minus u prime of x, right? So that's for a stable equilibrium. Now if you look at an unstable equilibrium, for the same reasons now we need to have, in an unstable equilibrium we have that f prime of x would be greater than zero, which corresponds to u double prime of x less than zero. So normally, we've used these conditions there, that are outlined in, in, in red, but now we don't have a potential, so we're going to have to use these conditions. So the force here is now the generalized force on this form. Um, note that this force does not correspond to the potential that we found up here. Take the derivative of this, you do not get the generalized force. The reason they're not related is because we have a forced constraint. And that's why we can't just do that. Okay. So let me just make that point too here. Okay, so with all that, let's let's calculate uh, what the derivative of Q, the generalized force, is. So Q prime Minus sign there, take the derivative of cosine. Okay, that's what that is. And we now have to investigate it for all these four, um, four equilibrium points. So let's do that first here. So theta one equals zero. So theta 1 equals 0, cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0. So this then becomes equal to, to that. So uh, this is less than 0 if this is the bigger part, right? If g is greater than r omega squared but it's greater than zero if g is less than r omega squared. And that, by the way, is the same condition that we found up here. Right, so let's, let's write it on the same form. And that actually strikes me that we did this wrong here, right? I wrote this only exists is possible if this is less than zero, obviously. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so this is either a stable equilibrium or an unstable equilibrium, depending on uh, depending on omega. Right, so if omega is low, less than this limit then it's a stable equilibrium. And if the omega is large, then it's an unstable equilibrium. Okay, so that's the first, the first, um, first equilibrium point. Second equilibrium point is theta equals pi. So that will be the next one. Theta 2 equals pi. When uh, theta equals pi, then we have that cosine, cosine of pi, is minus 1, and sine of pi is 0. 
Okay. So now let's look at the derivative of the generalized force at the second equilibrium point. So that will then become equal to m r minus omega squared minus g of r times minus 1. So m r squared omega squared plus g over r. Well, that's greater than zero, so that's always unstable. Uh, that's not too surprising, because if we look here again at the the rotating hoop, theta equals to pi corresponds to the bead being up here. So that's not so strange that that's an un unstable equilibrium point. Okay. Now we finally have theta 3, 4 remind myself what that was, r cosine of g over r omega squared. So the cosine of that, of course, is g over um, r omega squared. It's plus minus there. Uh, sine of theta 3 is the square root of 1 minus the square of the cosine. Okay. So we have that now. And then we can then calculate, looking just at omega 3, uh, at theta 3 for simplicity, times the cosine, but the cosine is g over r omega squared. So I'm copying from down there minus g over r, and then minus omega squared times sine squared, right? Okay, we can see here that goes away, and in fact the whole thing is zero. Now the sign of this can vary, but remember these equilibrium points only exist if g over r omega squared is less than one. So one minus g over r omega squared, squared, that's a number minus a number less than one squared, that's still going to be positive because this is less than one. So this is um, less than zero. So this is a stable when it exists. So those are the uh, those are the results. Um, and that answers the question that was posed. Uh, I'm going to do one other thing. This falls into uh, extra credit, uh, so, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's kind of useful for something that's going to come up later. So up here, we said that, well, we don't have any potential, because uh, we have the force constraint, we only have the generalized force here, right? Well, it turns out you can actually uh, write down the generalized force as uh, the derivative of a potential. This is in fact true in general. So let's take a look at that. Here's my generalized force. That's what it looks like. Um, but we could write that if we wanted to as the derivative of some effective potential. Right? So minus the derivative of u effective with respect to theta. And if we do that, I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you. We find that u effective of theta is going to be equal to um, minus mr squared times one half omega squared 
sine squared theta minus g over r cosine theta. All right, I'm going to write this now actually as two different terms. Let's see if we can't identify these. Minus mrg cosine theta. Well, that's the potential. So why don't we do the following? I'm going to grab the potential. I'm going to bring it down here. I'll do the same thing with the kinetic energy. Okay, so it looks here, just looking at these, trying to identify what we have, that um, this is the potential that we wrote down over here. This piece, this is the kinetic energy associated with, with the motion in the phi direction, right? Because what we have here. This is the velocity in the phi direction, remember? Right, so it's one half m v phi squared. So in other words, what we've done here, we have found an effective potential that includes not only the actual gravitational potential, but also a piece of the uh, kinetic energy. Right? U effective equals U gravitational minus T phi. And this comes about because of the force constraint. Sorry for all the scrolling. We have a force constraint up here. And this comes about because of the force constraint. If we take a look at the, the sketch again here, uh, we have rotation around the z-axis, so there's a kinetic energy associated with uh, the motion around in the phi direction. That kinetic energy depends not on uh, the time derivative of the generalized coordinates, right? It only depends on theta, not on theta dot. And therefore we could just move it over, uh, since the Lagrangian is Lt minus u, Lagrangian is T minus U, and that's actually equal to T theta plus T phi minus U gravity. Well, I can just say that, well, it's like this. And this is now the effective potential, and that's because T phi depends only on theta, not on theta dot. So we can actually plot this effective potential now that we have calculated, and I've done that here. See, leave myself a little more space. And this is done for uh, three different cases. This here is for omega less than the square root of g over r. Omega equals to the square root of g over r and omega greater than the square root of g over r. So if uh, we are rotating quickly, right, then what happens is that, uh, well, if we're rotating slowly, first of all, then the bead here only has an equilibrium at the very bottom. As the uh, rotation speed of the hoop increases and reaches a critical value, then the equilibrium at the bottom becomes unstable for omega larger than this pendulum frequency. And for larger values, we have two additional equilibria that appear, right? So this is theta three and theta four. And of course, here we have theta 1, and this is theta 2. So 
with this picture, it should be relatively clear how this, how this actually behaves. And the next step now that we actually have a potential uh, could be, I'm not going to do it though, but uh, what it could be is, the next step could be to calculate the uh, uh, frequencies of oscillation around each of the equilibrium points. Right? So we know that omega is in general equal to the square root of k over m, where k is u double prime, effective in this case, at the equilibrium points. The only thing you have to use here is that instead of m, you're going to have to use i equals mr squared because um, otherwise you wouldn't get the unit of uh, frequency here. We're dealing with uh, a generalized coordinate which is an angle and not a position. Okay, hopefully this makes this the results in this problem quite clear. Uh, this last portion here, as I said, is extra credit. You don't have to study it. Uh, but it will help later when we actually talk about effective potentials in the context of planetary motion.